This is my office. Um, <laughs> obviously, all the games that I've ever uh, been involved with uh, at Gearbox are up on these top shelves, and you know, a lot of the memorabilia and stuff from those games are there. And it, you know, it just kind of reminds me of where we've been and the things that we've accomplished. Uh, of course, I've got all my video game consoles from over the years. The story behind this is um, I had all these things in my garage and my wife was like, dude, we need to make some space. You need to get all this stuff out of here. And I'm like, well, and it was just, they were just collecting dust. So I'm like, so I went to Home Depot and I bought these, you know, water pipes and made these little stands and just, you know, Velcro taped them down and kind of made a little museum out of it. As long as I could remember, um, I've, I've played video games. The first like console thing I, I remember is something my dad bought me. I don't even have it here. It's uh, I was probably five years old, and it was um, had these little LED lights, three red ones and then a green one, three red ones and a green one, and a single controller was a stick, and it would go up and down. And then there was a digital timer, you know, like the old school LED watch, you know, that, and it, it would it would time things. And the idea was called like race car, and and, and it would go red, 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 uh, green, and when it hit green, you'd shift gears. And, and you have, you, sh you know, the faster you shift gears, then then the quicker it would proceed to the next set of LEDs. But if you shifted gears too soon, it would break. It would stop, like you blew your engine or something. And and the goal is to get to the end of the track in the fastest amount of time by shifting gears optimally. And that was the first game. Oh, uh, from there, you know, eventually consoles like this were created. This is a this is a Pong um, game. This is a Bentley. There's a whole bunch of Pongs. This is the one that that, that we had. This is a, an Atari C380. Um, seven pre-programmed games that were like uh, breakout variants and rebound variants and things like that. And there was a pinball. It says video pinball. <laughs> breakout was, of course, the meaningful thing in here. Um, and we know the Atari and the Intellivision, of course, and the ColecoVision. That's n this isn't my original ColecoVision. Um, in this era, I think ColecoVision is probably the system I played the most. This isn't an original. Uh, the original, I've, I've got at home, but um, the U.S. model, uh, there's a chip inside which uh, uh, corrodes after about 20 years, so it no longer becomes functioning. But in ca in Canada, they uh, they used a different component for that part, which survived. So I, I bought this particular one off of eBay. That's got the Canadian chip in it, so this guy still works. Vectrex. This this is cool. It's uh, all vector graphics. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. The the Master System, which I thought was brilliant in many ways, it's a better system than the 8-bit Nintendo. We had so many great games on the on the Nintendo. Of course, you know we probably spent a lot more time playing with that, but the the Sega Master System was really phenomenal. These are all the handhelds, of course. I, I, I think I need to add some to it. Probably get my DS Lite in here finally, and maybe my DSi, because I'm doing the 3DS now. On this side, of course, we're getting into modern history. Look at this. You know, the, the, on some things, you have a little protective layer. I haven't peeled that off yet, so you can still see the little protective layer on the turbo graphics there. And look at look how beat up that is. All the you know, from the cartridges going out. I don't know how many hours I spent playing, um, you know, AVP. Remember AVP on the Jaguar? Or um, Iron Soldier was pretty awesome. And, you know, the Genesis. I've got another Genesis somewhere that has the Over Ender CD and the 32X on it, but I, I, I couldn't find that. It's not in my garage. I, I think I pulled it out once to play, like, Starflight or something. You know, last-gen consoles. I, I guess soon um, I'll have to make room. I'll have to maybe scoot that over and put the Wii up there because we're going to have a Wii U soon. So, and I, I, the newest stuff is, of course, is I'm using it. It's a home, but, but as the system is retired, I, I bring it in here and just kind of throw it on the shelf. So I'll have to, eventually I'm going to have to add more shelves, I guess, because I'm going to run out of space. <laughs> I think I probably spent the most hours uh, with the Sega Genesis. There's so many great games on that guy. Um, I think that the Neo Geo, uh, though, like, it was super expensive, but what, what you were doing at, at home with that thing was amazing. It was so expensive, I, I don't even have the cartridge version, I have the CD version, but the games were so great for that era. Um, but I think hours spent, probably the Genesis, uh, some, of the, some of my fondest memories are, come from, from that time. But there's, I mean, every, you know, the, the, every system has some winners that stand out, you know. And uh, it's kind of cool to, because to, you know, in one view I can see you know, the history of the, the, the video game industry, you know, be reminded of where we've been and, and remember that. Let's see some other things. Um, oh, this is cool. This is the first uh, dollar that Gearbox made when, uh, when we got our first check for our first thing. I pulled a dollar out and I put it in that frame. It reminds me, of course, that it's a business. It's like we love creating entertainment, but if, if we don't at least make as much money as we spend, then we don't get to keep going. And I also feel a deep responsibility to all the people here whose livelihoods I'm responsible for. So we have to remember that. The other thing too is this, this picture. I'm not sure if you know the story of the picture of George Washington. 
the painting that that, um, that, that picture is based off of, uh, uh, if you look at the original, it's like the canvas is this big and only like this much of it was filled in. Like it was going to be a full body thing and, and the artist, I don't know what happened, maybe he ran out of time, maybe he died. Uh, the artist that painted that didn't finish the painting, but he prioritized the look of, of Washington and he got that gleam in the eye just right so that of all the paintings of Washington, uh, the U.S. government chose that one, this unfinished painting, to, to put on the dollar bill. And it kind of reminds us, um, as artists, you know, that artist that started that, he had the ambition to fill the entire canvas. But in the course of it, he prioritized the things that mattered most. And that was, that was the essence of Washington and the gleam in his eye. And, and because he prioritized the right things, uh, he actually made the biggest impact of, of our memory of this, of this great man. And when we're making video games along the, along the way, uh, we have to sometimes adapt what, you know, we start with an idea, we start with a vision, but we adapt along the way and prioritize what matters. And if we do a good job, then, uh, then, then, then what, we, what we end up with is impactful. Okay, so this one, this is, um, this is a Pac-Man watch. Circa 82, maybe, I don't know. I was in Maryland and I, and I, and I had the, my watch and, and there's all these kids around me. I was, I was a little boy and, and uh, uh, all these kids around that were enamored by this and I was kind of showing it off and I, I had this like, you know, kind of audience. I was holding court with all these kids that wanted to play with this watch. And, uh, and after I kind of dismissed them all, this one kid kind of hung, hung around. And um, a guy named Wade Callender. And he really wanted to play with the watch, so we ended up making a deal. And we, we signed a contract written in crayon on a piece of paper. And the contract was, he gave me a dollar and I let him borrow the watch for a night. And um, the guy, uh, Wade Callender, he was probably I was probably nine or ten years old, and he was probably like seven or eight. Um, he became a lawyer, and I became a game maker. And, and Wade now actually is our executive counsel here at Gearbox Software. <laughs> so that's like, and, and, and he, he got me this um, as, a, as a birthday gift a few years ago, like found, a, uh, uh, found one on the internet somewhere and, and, and bought it to remind me of that day. These are obviously our games and then some other things relating to the games. Uh, some of the games we do have ancillary things. Um, sometimes they're little promotional bits, sometimes they're actual ancillary products like the Brothers in Arms action figures. I think there's some comic books up there. Um, you know, face plates, you know, and things like that. These are neat. These are a little uh, a German tank and an American tank that, um, like a Sherman and a Panther, and they're remote control and you can, they actually can shoot. They don't shoot anything physical. It's like a little laser that the other one could register so you can have a little physical tank battle with these little remote control tanks. This was kind of neat. Ubisoft did this deal where they, they got, they put the game uh, on a USB stick. <laughs> so you just buy the USB hammer stick and the game's on there. These are cool, these little cubes. Whenever we ship a game, we have these cubes made and everybody on the development team gets one. And so it's kind of, uh, and this one's for Road to Hill, Brothers in Arms Road to Hill 30, and this little crystal cube with the logo in it. And it's kind of cool if you walk around the studio, uh, Gearbox, you'll see people have all their cubes stacked, or some of them have them all on display. And, and the more cubes you've got, the more badass you are, because that means the more games you've shipped. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of, and there's a couple that are special cubes, like for secret projects and things that are like really, really rare. There's, I think the rarest is um, uh, just one dozen of them exist, and, and it's for a, a project that, that I should never talk about. But <laughs> uh, this is my desk and my computer, and this is you know the hallway and obviously a glass window. Uh, anyone can walk by at any time and see exactly what I'm working on. And um, one of our principles at Gearbox is that we're transparent and we're we're confident in our in what what we're doing and the value that we're bringing. Um, so. Uh, I, I'm, I use myself as an example. Anyone can see that I'm what I'm doing at my computer, and uh, and I, and the hope is that that we all are, are confident in our own contributions, and we're all comfortable with with being exposed to one another and being transparent with one with one another. This is especially true in a, true in a creative industry, which has so much subjectivity in it. We need to kind of do things and try things and be comfortable with the judgment that'll happen. And it's only by being comfortable with that that we can learn from it and uh, adapt and make new decisions later. So anyway, yeah, it's my office. <laughs>